If you will be opening your Bibles to the New Testament in Matthew chapter 19. I want to remind you that the question that we have in verse 3 that the Pharisees asked of Jesus was not an honest question. They were not trying to learn more about the truth and deeply interested in changing their lives to fit the truth. They were dishonest and they were desiring to entrap Jesus. And they chose something that was a great dispute at that particular time over the interpretation of Moses' statement in Deuteronomy 24, verse 1. Let me read what is familiar to most of us here in Matthew 19, starting in verse 1. Now, let me preface this by saying that Jesus has left the Galilean area, and virtually everything on the west side of Jordan is closed to him. If you follow what we're looking at here, you will see in verse 1, it came to pass when Jesus had finished these sayings, he departed from Galilee. And then it says in the King James Version, and came into the coast, which means the borders of Judea beyond Jordan. This was the normal route that the Jews took when they were traveling either from Galilee to Judea, Judea back up to Galilee because they avoided Samaria. And we all know, I think, how the Bible teaches us the Jews' attitude toward the mongrel race, as they would view it, of Samaritans. He's in an area called Perea. It's very interesting that the topic comes up here because this is Herod Tetrarch's dominion. And you'll remember that it was John the Baptizer, the forerunner of the Christ, who had declared in no uncertain terms to Herod that it's unlawful for you to have your brother Philip's wife. Now that had all taken place not too long before the Lord was there. Now he's going down to Jerusalem. It's getting toward the end of things as far as Christ's life is concerned. And you still see in verse 2, and great multitudes followed him and he healed them. But this is what is known if you read... Um, commentary sometimes is the Perean ministry so he's over there to the east of of the Jordan River in Herod Tetrarch's dominion and you see there are Pharisees there of the same disposition of heart as there was in Judea or Galilee because they're Pharisees and they bear the stamp of what Pharisees thought and did and, and, and taught others but he still has great multitudes following him. And then you think about this question that's put to him and where he is and who he just put who to death because of saying it's not lawful for you to have your brother Philip's wife, speaking to Herod Tetrarch. I think it's important to understand something about the word marriage, it can be used and is used scripturally as God joins together a man and a woman who are qualified to marry, as in verse 6, wherefore they are no more twain or two but one flesh, what therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. But marriage is also used accommodatively, not to refer necessarily to Matthew 19, 6, God joined undefiled bed marriage. Because it says that of Herod, which he had his brother Philip's wife, that he had married her. But she's still his brother Philip's wife. So that ought to tell of something that even though civil law, because they were the civil law, had divorced them, civil law did not set aside God's law. And thus, John the baptizer still declared to Herod, it is not lawful, couldn't be civil law, could it? It is not lawful for thee, Herod, to have her. Why? She's still your brother Philip's wife. Yes, but civil law, he is the king, his word is law, has separated them. Well, it didn't change what God joined together. Matthew 96. It didn't mean that God recognized 
or took his order from a king or any civil government to change his law. And thus, John could still say, Herod, it is not lawful for you to have who? Your brother Philip's wife. Now, that's one thing that made Herodias so upset, upset and put her daughter up to dancing a very lewd dance and appeal to Herod and she knew how to wrap him around her little finger and then she asked for the head of John the Baptist on a charger. So now you've got Jesus coming to this same area, teaching and doing like he always did and there are great multitudes there. And the Pharisees are as they were, for remember when you're introduced in Matthew to the Pharisees in John's time, that uh, he jumps all over them and calls them a generation of vipers who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Talking about his preaching and what they needed to do. And say not to yourselves that we have Abraham to our father for God can of these stones raise up children of Abraham. Uh, bring forth fruit, meat for repentance is what he said you do. Change your life. So they're still the same. And that was earlier on. So he's over here in that area. And who comes to him but the Pharisees, verse 3, and notice they're tempting him. They're trying him. They're putting him to the test. As I said earlier, they're not honest. And so they've contrived this question. Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And he answered and said unto them, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female, and said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain or two shall be one flesh. Wherefore, which is a conclusion in the light of everything I just told you, they are no more two but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. They say unto him, Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and put her away? He saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. And I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery, and whoso marrieth her which is put away, committeth adultery. Having read all of that, let's go back now and do a little more studying. The expression from Deuteronomy 24.1, which carries with it the idea of the wife had engaged in some unclean thing, comes from a Hebrew word, erva, and it means nakedness, nudity, shame, uh, shameful exposure, that kind of thing. Now, Rabbi Hillel was very liberal in his interpretation, and the Jews who followed his teachings believed that divorce could be obtained for the most trivial reasons for every cause. Now remember the question they ask. But Rabbi Shammai, emphasizing the word nakedness, taught that there must be shameful conduct or unchastity. Now here's what these Jews were doing, these Pharisees. They basically posed this, and in effect they're saying, now whose side are you on? <laughs> That's exactly what they're up to. Well, Jesus doesn't side with Hillel or Shammai, but he goes beyond Moses back to the beginning. As we study this morning, that's the reason I read those passages this morning from Genesis. He goes back to the beginning. You see, he's going to restore marriage to what it was when God established it in the first place. So he goes all the way back beyond the law of Moses and the Jewish people who approached God under the law. And he made that very clear that that was temporary as to what governed them and why Moses did what he did in Deuteronomy 24.1, remembering it was God's will for Moses in spite of the Holy Spirit when he gave these things. But it was temporary and it was meant to be forever. And in this case, in this particular guideline, it certainly dealt with the hardness of the people's hearts, that is, the men. It really protected the woman when uh, she would be given a writing of divorcement. Because you're dealing with the time and just a cursory reading of the Old Testament tells you this. That if, um, and you may understand something about uh, certain people in the Middle East, the way they treat women nowadays. If you don't kowtow to me, then, you know, you can be gotten rid of them in a hurry. And that was pretty much the attitude. Well, here's a question we might raise concerning Hillel and Shammai when Jesus doesn't side with either one and returns back to the beginning to restore marriage as God originally in the garden created it and revealed it to man. 
He says, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? Well, Jesus answers what? No. You know, he doesn't pull any punches, in effect. He says, now you have your own scriptures. Remember, these are Pharisees. So, in effect, he's saying you have the Bible there. Have you not read it? Do you realize what a punch in the nose that was to these people to ask a bunch of Pharisees, haven't you read your own Bible? Could you be so ignorant of your own Bible that you magnify so much? Have you not read that he who made them from the beginning? Now watch how we break this down. He made them male and female. That's the first thing. Number two, a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. And let me talk about the word cleave. It comes from a word here that means uh, glue, to glue together. You can't separate it. Now, that's the attitude of two people of free moral agents, a man and a woman, when they're qualified to be married, and they choose to be married, and God joins them together. You can't get them apart. They're not going to let it happen. You know, if, if that was the attitude of people entering a marriage, there would be very little time we'd have to talk about divorce and remarriage. In other words, they're determined to stay together through thick, thin, or whatever else. They're sticking. They're sticking with it. So you see, that evidently doesn't happen with some people. But this is what the Lord said. And number three, the two shall be one flesh. There's that sticking and it makes it one flesh. Not literally two individual physical bodies becoming one. It's an attitude. It's a desire. It's the planning. It's the purposing. It's the not talking about I and my, but we and us from then on out. And when you make your plans, you're thinking about your wife or your husband or your children. It's a unit. Organized as God wants it. Between two people who are going to stick together, let come what may until death do them part. And they're not going to let anything in this world stop them from being husband and wife. I like what an old man said to me in my first full-time work. He said, I, he said, I told my wife we had never part because everywhere she went, I was going. So if she ran off, I was going with her. <laughs> well, I like that attitude. <laughs> he was quite a character. But he was pretty smart because his first wife died and he went back and married his sister out of the same home. So that sounds, he must have had that down pretty good. And I knew those people all the way back to somewhere back in the Old Testament times. <laughs> but uh, anyway, and they came, from a, they came from a bunch of good people. The two shall be one flesh. And then the fourth thing, what therefore God has joined. That's so important. This is God's institution for the good of man. And thus to have it so it will bless man, we meet his qualifications to be what he wants us to be. Therefore what God has joined together, let not man put asunder. Again, that's verses 4 through 6 that we've just looked at. I want to emphasize again too the word let. If you look in the grammar of the whole thing, it means don't even attempt to break this thing up because you can't. That's what he's saying. It's God, by those two people desiring to be in a marriage, who joins them together. And it's God who is going to dissolve it. And even if they want to get out of it, then they can't. Except for one reason. We'll talk about that in a minute. So they come back at him and say, well, now, if this is the case, made them male and female, man leave his father and mother and cleave, stick to his wife, the two shall become one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. If that's the case, then pop, here comes the fact that they reveal they have read the Bible a little bit, even if it might be ulterior motives. Because they say, why then did Moses command to give a bill of divorcement, writing a divorcement, and to put her away? You know, Jesus was never somebody that was put on the spot. <laughs> he had no problem with this. He simply replies that this practice was allowed because of the hardness of their heart, as I said a moment ago. Now, what do they say to that? In fact, that's a reflection upon them. That God really was accommodating them and protecting the woman. We could go back and spend a lot more time studying the Old Testament teaching on this, but that's not our purpose right now. They understood it very well, but the thing was happening with the Pharisees and others among the Jews. It happens all over the place, but among those who think they're Christians, and most of them aren't. And that is, they give lip service to God and Christ and the Bible, but they really don't 
know it and they really don't obey it. They do pretty much as they please. Here's a question. Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? I pointed out that Jesus answered no. But from the beginning it, that is the practice of divorce, hasn't been so. That's what he's saying to them. It hasn't been so. He then goes on to answer the question, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? Again, and I say unto you. Now, I don't know why the translators did this, but and would be far more accurately translated if it was but. And some translations have it here. And I say unto you, but, I say, in contrast, I, the Son of God, say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, that's as broad as the human race, whosoever, Except it be for fornication, that's an acceptive clause. Here's the rule, here's the exception. And shall marry another, committeth adultery, and whoso marrieth her which is put away, doth commit adultery. Now let's hold that in mind and notice that marriage, as God created it and wants it to be practiced among men, is a very happy relationship. But it takes both partners, both husband and wife, doing their part. Now we have noticed in Ephesians 5, 22 and 23, there are other passages such as 1 Corinthians 7, 1 through 5 that shows the responsibility of each spouse one to another. Physical attraction between a man and a woman is not wrong. It's been abused. It's been misused. But I would say to every man here, didn't your wife attract you? If she didn't, turn around and tell her that right now. <laughs> And I want to say that, believe it or not, as ugly as a bunch of us are, we must have had some sort of attraction to our wives. Now, I won't say anything what I just said to the wives. They may have felt sorry for us. <laughs> I don't know. All facetiousness aside, there's attraction. There's physical attraction. It goes along with this life. It's part of it. It can be regulated like any other desire that fits the physical and the affairs of this present world. And God did. Physical intimacies are approved by God. He made us that way. He does have no problem with the desire of sex being gratified. But he says, here's where it's going to be. Are you sin? Nowhere else, but it's going to be here. And that's what man doesn't like. And we see that already just running rampant in our society today. Because outside of a Matthew 19, 6, God joined undefiled bed marriage, physical intimacy is called fornication. When is the last time you heard anything out of television or Hollywood talking about the, using the terms fornication and adultery? Unless they're making light of it. You don't. Now we've got a generation of people raised up in homes that know very little about the Bible that are all messed up themselves as we talked about this morning when it comes to the way homes ought to be. And what do you think a child's going to learn in those homes about fornication or adultery? They may be living in the midst of a, we'll put that home in quotes, that is nowhere near like the Bible teaches a marriage and a home ought to be. Well, what do you expect them to turn out to be? If they do turn out to enter into a marriage that God talks about, it's almost by happenstance, not by design. And that rarely happens. Notice what is said in Hebrews 13, 4, for I've, I've alluded to it before. Marriage is honorable. Well, now, you know, if God says an institution is honorable, what do you think the devil's going to say about it? The devil's going to do everything possible to say marriage is backward. It's passe. It's old hat. And that's what's happening. But God said it's honorable. And we who believe in God and Christ and the Bible is the word of God, then we want a marriage to be honorable in the sight of Almighty God. Then he adds this to it. Marriage is honorable and in all in the bed undefiled. But now notice how quickly he does this. And this doesn't sound like Hollywood. But whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Again, that's Hebrews 13, 4. Great emphasis should be placed upon making marriage successful as God defines success and thus it will be honorable and to the benefit of all involved. You know, like anything worthwhile, it takes work. It takes each one, husband and wife, loving one another as the Bible teaches they ought to. 
And it's not a love that's just emotion. It's a love that says, I have a duty to perform. And I'm going to perform it. I'm going to please God in the way I am a husband, in the way that I am a father, in the way I am a wife and mother, and so on. So it's important that we know that we have a living, active faith and that we teach and defend the truth that relates to marriage, divorce, and remarriage. Now I said earlier, as you saw this morning, uh, and I don't need to say it, it was just simply to bring out what's obvious to every one of us, that the home and marriage is in terrible shape nowadays and it doesn't seem to be getting any better. Somebody once said, and you may have heard this, that, well, you know, Noah just didn't do that good a job in reaching people with the preaching that he did. Folks, listen, if everybody in the world had done what Noah did with his family, there wouldn't have been a flood. Just think about it. There was Noah and Ms. Noah. There was Shem and Ms. Shem. There was Ham and Ms. Ham. And Japheth and Ms. Japheth. And you know, that was at a time when everybody's mind was only on evil continually. And one of the first things they did was begin to engage in polygamy. Contrary to what was taught in the beginning. And our Lord carried us back to the beginning to restore marriage as God intended it and originally revealed it to man. So what does that say about this um, unit in society? If we could get people being what they ought to be as husband, wife, mother, and daddies and children to parents... What do you think would happen to the nation? But that's where it's going to be. That's where it's going to be. It'll always be there. And as long as men rebel against God's word concerning the marriage and the home, then it's going to get worse and worse and worse. You have one problem and you build on that problem. It's just like having a good foundation laid and you build on that foundation something better. And as we go out today to try to convert people to Jesus Christ by teaching them the gospel, don't you know that one of the things we're going to run into, the very first thing, if you're the statistics we emphasized this morning, and your own personal experience tells you that with people you associate with, you're going to have to deal with marriage, divorce, and remarriage. You're going to have to get people to see God has a pattern. He has a plan for a godly marriage for husbands and wives as parents. And if they are unwilling to change their lives, to comply with what God's Word says marriage is and the responsibilities of husbands and wives and parents, they're not going to be able to become Christians because they won't repent of ungodly marriages and ungodly parents. Some who teach false doctrine regarding divorce and remarriage, use the argument that nowhere in the scriptures can you find the word remarriage. And thus they contend it's an unscriptural term. You know, sometimes I really wonder at the IQ of people. I mean that seriously. The people would go into such a stretch that they would say, well, the Bible doesn't talk about remarriage. I can make the same argument when it comes to the Great Commission. Find, please, where the Lord ever said by using the specific words, Great Commission. But it accurately describes what he did when he said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. It's great. And he commissioned them to do it. You can't find in the Bible the word Bible like appears on the front of your Bible. So I don't intend to spend much time on something that we should have learned back in grade school when it comes to English. But when you break down a word, it sometimes has different components. And remarriage just happens to have what is called a prefix. That's the R-E before marriage. And an R-E means in repeating or doing again. Now, are there people marrying again? Are there people repeating marriages today? So then it's remarriage. And remarriage is at the crux of Jesus' thought in Matthew 19 and verse 9. Look at it again. And I, or but I, say unto you, whosoever, whosoever is broad as human race, as it applies to, shall put away his wife, speaking of the man putting away a wife, but then he says, except it be for fornication. Now, if you turn over to Mark 10, 
in Mark's account of this, you won't have the exception. And you have some people say, see, Mark and Matthew disagree. Well, he who made the law is the one who has the right to put in the exception. And you cannot find all the Bible teaches on any subject in just one verse. We wouldn't know what the plan of salvation was if we just tried to find it in one or two verses. It's when we look at all of what the New Testament says concerning exactly at what point God remits an adult sin, that is, one who is old enough to be taught the gospel and understand it by his own will obey it. You can't find any one verse. But you take all of what the Bible says on that topic in its immediate context, that is, where every verse dealing with it is right there, in its remote context where they're all used out here, you put it together and God gave you a brain. And he says, come let us reason together. When Paul preached, as Luke records in Acts two or three times, it will say of Paul that he reasoned as he preached. I've heard a lot of sermons that had no reasoning in it when they preached. And when you got through with those sermons, all you had to say was, what in the world did the man say or what was he driving at or what was his point? And you don't know. He didn't reason if you did your part as a listener. There's a lot of that kind of yelling and stomping going on. And seemingly people like it. But if you preach the gospel like God wants it, then you're setting out evidence. You're making an argument to prove a point. And you come to that point. It's like Paul preached righteousness. He reasoned of righteousness and judgment to come. And he reasoned with them, the synagogues. What does that mean? How do you reason with somebody? It means he said, if this is the case, and this is the case, and this is the case, here's our conclusion. It's inescapable. That's exactly what he did. And that's the way preaching ought to be. So that was done. And we must needs also do that same thing. Now, what's God's original plan? When he created male and female in the beginning, he established the divine relationship that we know as the home. Genesis 2, 18 and 24. May I point out again in passing, though it doesn't touch directly on it, but it certainly hits things nowadays, that when you look at Jesus referring to what they were doing, the Pharisees were doing and attempting to do, when he starts back at the beginning, he brings out, have you not read, that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female. Now today if we go out and teach the gospel, we may come across lesbians or homosexuals. They may come out of homes that wouldn't know how to spell Bible. They wouldn't know it if it fell on their head because their parents didn't know much about it. And they may be just following the current events or the current whatevers. But if you get them to believe the Bible is the very word of God, and obviously that could be done because Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians there were brethren who had been that way when they were in the world and they had heard and believed the gospel and became Christians. Because he says in such word, past tense, used to be some of you. Well, then when I read, he made them in the beginning male and female. Notice that's the human race. That's all there is to it. When you think of the human race, you think of male and female. And you know, somebody may think in his mind, I'm female. Or some female may think, I'm male. That means your thinking's wrong. That's all that means. You're still male and you're still female. If somebody wants to think I'm a tree, or maybe I'm a little teapot, short and stout. Well, all right, I guess you call that a trans teapot mentality. But if it's what a person thinks he is, when his thinking doesn't correspond with reality about him, then he needs help or she needs help to come back to what God said in his word and God created us and Jesus says here he made them male and female. But he adds more to it. For this cause, for what cause? The human race is made male and female. It's for that cause that a man, that's a male you know, 
leave father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they too, male and female, shall be one flesh. Folks, if you go to dealing with folks who are of this um, warped mentality, and that's what it is, and I mean that kindly, that's just what it is then here is the place to go or else go actually to Genesis that our Lord's quoting from and just lay that out. Now I say, well, I don't believe in God and I don't believe in the Bible. Well, then let's talk about proofs of the existence of God. And let's talk about proofs for the inspiration of the Bible. And then let's talk about what the Bible teaches. But we have to begin somewhere and the further society gets away from God and from the inspiration of the scriptures and from Jesus Christ and from the gospel, the more work we have to do. And, you know, we have to do that still having to do what we've done for hundreds of years, and that is deal with the denominational false doctrine. That We still we just have to add that to it. There was a time we didn't have to be too much concerned about the first part, but we got to do it all now. And that's our obligation. We can't shirk that obligation. That's part of how we influence the world. And the church is primarily a teaching institution. We teach by example, but I'm talking about knowing our Bible well enough to articulate it and show to others what God said. I think that you think about this business of male and female, and you can almost, by being uh, ridiculous, teach some marvelous lessons that people understand. Just try to take an electrical cord and plug it in without thinking male and female. Now, why in the world is that way? It's because God made the human race male and female. And they're going to have to have a trans something when it comes to electric cord. If they're ever going to get work, I change names. Folks, a lot of times some things are dealt with not so much, not that it shouldn't be, in such a deep manner, but just to ridicule it to death to show how absurd it is and then come back and teach the plain old truth on it. And that's one of the things we need to keep in mind. So he made the male and female. Man leaves his father and mother, cleaves his wife, and the two become one flesh. And God's joined them together when they will to be husband and wife and were qualified to be husband and wife. And then they ask why about that. And he told them. Then we understand that the groundwork, I hope, is laid so that in going back to the original plan, as we hope to do, we can build on that. When he created them, male and female, in the beginning, he established a divine relationship that we know as the home. And I want to close on that note. Folks, this is nothing we can tamper with any more than we can remove steps in the plan of salvation, any more than you can remove the New Testament's teaching on the organization of the church or the worship of the church and the acts of worship. The home is a divine institution. God regulates it. Just because some people say, well, I want to be married. That doesn't mean you're authorized to be married. Are you qualified to be married? Or are you in a state where you never will be able to be married because you're not qualified to be married? I want to sow those things out there, not because some of you haven't been exposed to them, but just simply to say this is where we want to begin and continue our study because we're going to get even more detailed in some of this. But one of the things you need to do in trying to teach other people is cause them to ask the question, has Jesus authorized me to contract a scriptural marriage? In the life that I'm presently living, do I have that authorization from him? See, Colossians 3.17 covers as much as anything else. And I need to ask then as a man, am I being what the New Testament authorizes me to be as a husband or as a father and the same as a wife and a mother? Wouldn't we do that concerning our worship? Well, what are the five acts of worship? Where did we learn there were five acts of worship? What, what are they? Where did we learn we're to assemble on the first day of the week? Well, we learn it from the authorized Word of God, that is, the Word of Jesus Christ. This is not just done because we want to, because it suits us. And so it is when it comes to marriage and the home. It's divine, and God has the last word in it. And that's the way we want it. 
just like when it comes to the plan of salvation or the worship of the church or the organization of the church or Christian living. God has the right to tell us. We have the right to ascertain His authority and to submit to it. If you're not a child of God today, we urge you to believe with all of your heart that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God, that you'll repent of your sins in compliance with Acts 17.30, confess your faith in Jesus as the Son of God, Romans 10.10, 10, and complete your obedience to the gospel by being immersed in water by the authority of Christ, and in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, to obtain the remission of sins, Acts 2.38. Matthew 28, 18, verses following, Acts 22, 16, Galatians 3, 26, and 27, and so on. Now, that's the way you become a Christian. There's not any other way. God has the last say in it. That's his plan of salvation. I dare not tamper with it. I can simply tell you what he said and urge you to obey it. As a child of God, then, you've got to ask, am I living as the authority of Christ directs me? Am I submitting to my Savior, who I claim my King and Savior, since I obeyed the gospel? Am I, am I following him? Well, if you haven't, then you need to repent of wherever it is you're not following Him. Confess those sins and pray God for forgiveness. There's one of the wonders of it all is that God loves us and stands ready to forgive every one of us if we're willing to align our lives with His directions. If we're unwilling to do that, we cannot be saved. So obey the gospel now if you need while we stand and sing. <laughs>